What's up, Lock High? How y'all doing today? You know, I want to share my story with you, but I'm not here to preach or try to tell you what you should and shouldn't do. You know if you're doing something and it's not right, you know what you got to do. So I'm just going to share some life experiences, and hopefully these life experiences will open your eyes to other opportunities. Um, you know, back, I was actually a straight-A student growing up. But before I get into that, it's a little background on myself. I've been to juvenile hall. I've been to CYA. I've been to the federal prison. I've done over 10 years of my life behind bars. So I've been out now for about nine years. And um, I've been around the toughest, the craziest, the hardest criminals in the world. And I've been around people who are never coming home. So, you know, I'm very fortunate to be out here sharing this with you because I would hope that you would never have to go to the places I've been to to get the game to be successful in life. Um, I was hard headed, so, you know, it took me a few times before I actually was able to recognize my true potential. But, um, you know, I, I finally got it right and I'm here with you today. So uh, hopefully you guys can like peep some game and, 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 um, and not do what I did. But anyways, um, yeah, you know, I, growing up, I was a straight A student. You know, I always had dreams or aspirations of owning my own business or being an athlete or doing something creative. You know, um, I pretty much got straight A's all through, all through grade school, all the way up until probably my junior year. I got maybe a B here and there, but um, I never really got in any trouble. I used to skateboard, BMX. Um, I even designed clothes in high school. I had my own clothing line when I was 16 years old. So. I was always hustling and doing different things, you know, trying to find ways to make money. Um, it came a point when my mom was going through a divorce, because I grew up primarily on military bases, so I had a pretty good group of friends around me. But uh, when my mom got divorced, we got kicked off the base, and we moved to Sacramento, which is kind of like where I grew up at, and we moved to the hood. And where I moved to this particular area, I mean, you know, I had lived in different parts of Sacramento, but this particular area I lived at was on a dope street. And there was a lot of dudes fresh off the pen that lived up the street, a lot of hustlers, a lot of dudes who were gangsters who always, you know, went up and down the street, nice cars, playing music. So I kind of, these guys kind of had a big impact on me. So, you know, initially I, didn't, I still, you know, stuck with sports. I did good in, um, in school. I got, you know, honor roll, 4.0 grade point average. Freshman year, I played uh, football, I played basketball, but um, you know, my mom worked two jobs, and I had, you know, I had some family out there, but I never really had that family support to where I had somebody validate my dreams and aspirations. You know, I never wanted to be just the average kid. I always wanted to be you know, successful at a level where you know, I see people on TV. I wanted to, I was a big dreamer. So, you know, come sophomore, it was freshman summer, and, um, you know, I started getting more involved in just the neighborhood stuff. You know, I started, um, I felt like being a square wasn't cool no more. So instead of, instead of like, you know, doing the football practice stuff, I started hanging out at the park. I started kicking it with the homies. I started, you know, kind of claiming the hood, you know, got into it with some dudes at summer school, started banging. And, um, you know, I've seen these drug dealers, and I'm like, I've seen all the girls liking the drug dealers because they come up to the school, and they get out their cars, and they're bumping. They got the Ds and, you know, Jerry Curls back then. And, you know, I'm like, oh, these dudes is fly. You know, I thought it would be cool if I was one of these guys and had all the girls, and I could make some money, help my mom out. So, you know, I'm going to sell drugs, but nobody in my family was involved with drugs, you know. And I didn't know anything about crack. It was popping back in the 80s, but... I, didn't, I wasn't really hip to it, so uh, I had a homeboy and I asked him, I said, can you get some crack? And he's like, yeah. And he's like, okay, well, you know, what can I get for $20? So I caught my first 20 piece, and basically he said, man, just ride up and down your street, somebody will hit you up. So I got this 20 piece, and um, I'm, I'm on a 10 speed, I'm riding up and down the street, and I'm kind of like just holding it in my hand, and I'm waiting to, I'm like, what do I do? I just keep riding back and down the street, you know? Finally, somebody drove past and they nod at their head. I'm like, okay, this must be a smoker. So I nodded my head too. And they like, what's up, what you got? I'm like, what you need? i like, I got a dub. He's like, okay, let me get a dub. So I gave him the dub. I took off back to my homeboy's house. I got a, four, a 20 double up. I had 40 now, I sold that, went back again. So I got a 40 double up, I, you know, I sold the 80. By the end of the day, I had like $200. I'm like, damn, 
I'm balling. You know what I'm saying? I'm 15, ain't got a job. I'm, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm on my 10 speed. You know, I got some money. My mom, mind you, was at work. So she didn't really know what was going on. You know, I had a little brother and sister. I used to babysit, but what I would do is I would do my homework and then kind of put them, put them to bed and I'd be out. And mom wouldn't get home until four in the morning, so she would go to work at eight, so she wouldn't know what was going on. So all during the night, I'd be out there slanging dope with grown men. And, um, you know, I, got, I, I bought into that lifestyle. So once I had that mentality and I got used to that fast money, it wasn't long before, you know, I was, you know, trying to, I was dropping a little, I would hide money in my mom's um, and her dresser drawer or try to buy groceries and I had new shoes and clothes and she'd be looking at me like, where's this coming from? I said, man, I got a little job. I was cutting some mowing some lawns and I did this over here. And she's like looking at me like, yeah, right. You know, but she didn't really have the time to watch me. So I just kept making the moves. And you know, it would, it would get so bad sometimes that we'd be eating dinner and our kitchen, win our, our living room window faced out to the street there'd be smokers driving by, waving like this, getting out the car, like, what's happening? And she'd be looking at me like, what is it? who's that? I'm like, I don't know. I think people, I think they're confused. And um, I would play it off, and then I'd go outside with my basketball and bounce the basketball, and I'd set the dope on the ground. They'd pick the dope up, leave the money, I'd pick the money up, and I'd be selling dope right in front of my mom. She didn't even know what I was doing. And, um, you know, this went on for a while. And at the same time, I'm still banging the hood, funking with, you know, other neighborhoods, and just being, just wilding out, you know, from a straight A student to selling drugs, and it's kind of, it just changed my life. It was very impactful. I was 15, and um, it, 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 you know, it left a big impression on me. Well, eventually, you know, all things come to an end, and everybody that sells drugs usually gets caught. Well, I got caught, so I had to go to juvenile hall. Mom came to see me. She was pissed. She's like, I'm not going to be coming down here to be visiting you. You know, I got other things to do and this is embarrassing for me. I'm not going to be coming back and forth dealing with nobody in jail. So, you know, I was mad. I was mad because I got caught. I was mad because I was in here with these other knuckleheads. And I was mad because it just, I was frustrated. You know, I didn't, I didn't meet my goal. I, I had a financial goal. I was going to, you know, invest in the stock market. I was going to do all this stuff, buy me a, a cutlass on some D's. You know, I didn't, I didn't reach none of that. You know, I got cracked. So I'm sitting in juvenile hall. I had to do six months while I was in there, you know, basically I'm just look, you know, I'm so young. I can't really comprehend the extent of what I'm, what I'm actually looking at. So I'm just kind of doing my time. But at the same time, I'm just looking at these other guys around me. And most of them are at this point, probably career criminals. They're, these guys are going out because we were at the juvenile hall. I was at on the weekends, you can get visits and you can get passes. And, you know, my mom, because she was mad and at me, she didn't really come visit me like that. So I stayed there most of the weekends while people went home. But anyways, during these visits, the guys would come back from Friday to Sunday and they'd be selling dope even though they were locked up. So these guys were still selling dope. And I was kind of like jealous because I'm like, damn, I can't sell no dope. You know what I mean? I can't go home and sell dope. But that's what was going on. And that was the mentality of the group of guys I was doing my time with. So eventually I got out of juvenile hall, you know, um, my mom moved, which was a good thing for me, because if we hadn't moved, I probably would have got into trouble a lot sooner because I still had the mentality like, I'm going to get this money. So anyway, my mom got married. We moved from Sacramento, North Islands, to Huntington Beach, the OC. Now, the OC, it was a totally this different experience. I've never experienced this type of culture shock. Um, you know, the kids there, they wore flip-flops, you know, these dudes were, you know, they were nerdy, nobody cared about Jordans, nobody, most of these guys had never gotten a fist fight, you know, it was just a total different, it's a total different environment. Out of the whole school, there was maybe five blacks and maybe um, six Hispanics, and we all stuck together. We were all buddies. All of us hung out, and we felt like, you know, it was kind of like you felt like an outcast. But, um, you know, I tried my best to fit in, but I was frustrated and I really didn't, I, I couldn't stand going to school at this point. I was, even though I was a good student, I was really, I felt out of my element. And so, you know, going there for the last two years of my high school year, a lot of politics. I was good in sports, but because of politics, I couldn't really, I couldn't play on a football team or they, they didn't want to play me when I played. And then they wouldn't let me play basketball. So, you know, pretty much when it came time to graduate, I was ready just to leave. I was ready to get the hell out of there. Well, my mom and them ended up moving back east, and me, instead of going with them, because I didn't really get an invite, 
I went back to Sacramento. Bad decision. I go back to Sacramento. The homies are out there banging. It's cracking. You know, I wasn't out there probably three weeks. We go to see Boys in the Hood. Boys in the Hood goes down. It's, 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 a, it's the blood. It's the cuz. It's all that bullshit going on. Somebody starts shooting in the theater. I run out, we, we run out, rush out the theater. I get into a dude in the, um, going out to the parking lot. He hits me and takes off running. I run after him because he hit like a little girl. And um, he reaches under his car seat and pulls out a strap. And he's like, what's happening? I'm like, what's happening? Put the gun down. He's like, no, what's happening? And he pulls the gun out. And by the grace of God, I hit the ground. And the bullets go over me. He hits a girl in the background and he hits a cop. He gets involved in a high-speed chase in a parking lot and they arrest him. Now, I book it up out of here. I don't want to get questions, so I leave. And um, basically, that's the start of my summer in Sacramento was this shootout. So following this shootout, you know, we, we're, you know, downtown, where shit happens, we get into some dudes down there. We were fighting, banging downtown, and it just, it was just one, one incident after another. We go to a club, we get rushed in the club, we get into with some dudes. Now, I'm supposed to be preparing myself for junior college. You know, I hadn't really taken the time or nobody had really laced me because I didn't have a mentor on the SATs. Had I known that, maybe I would have took the SATs. I didn't, even, I didn't even know anything about the SATs. So when I graduated, all I thought about was junior college. I didn't even consider trying to even uh, go to a four-year college, but I wanted to go to college to some degree, just I guess there's something to do. I didn't really know what I wanted to major in or what I wanted to do, but I figured, hell, you know, by the time I do three or four years in there, I'll figure it out. So I'm, I'm half-assed going to college, and I'm still in the streets. You know, I'm packing a little deuce deuce. I'm still hanging out. Well, a guy who I, you know, was a homie, not really a homie, but associate from our neighborhood, is like, hey, man, I got a lick for us. We could rob this drug dealer. He's got a bunch of money. I'm like, what? Is that right? I'm like, yeah. He's like, man, just give me a ride. You drive, and I'll go up in there. I'll do everything, and we'll split it up. It always sounds good, but it's always some bullshit. It didn't go down like that. We go to the guy's house. You know, I'm driving. He gets out. He's in there for what seems like over an hour. I go to look to see what's going on. He's just, he's on one. He's going through all type of stuff. There is no drugs. There's no drugs, there's no money. Well, they got people tied up in the room. They got, you know, the, the people screaming. It's just, it's just, it's madness. So I'm like, man, let's get the hell up out of here, man. We end up leaving, we get away with it. Nothing happens, you know, for three, three months, nothing happens. Well, this guy gets busted stealing CDs from a record store and tells on everything he's ever did in his life, everything. So he tells on me, he tells on my other homeboy that was with us, he tells on, he just tells on whatever he knows about. And basically, I get cracked probably three to four months after this incident. I'm going to CYA, I'm going to California Youth Authority. California Youth Authority is gladiator school. You know, people think the pen is bad. Well, CYA is everything from 13 to 25, and it's just a bunch of young riders. Motherfuckers, excuse me, people in there banging, you know? Um, it, it's, it's, it's just, you know, YA is no joke, but, um, I, get, I end up getting sentenced to two years, eight months in California Youth Authority. So I get in the California Youth Authority and I'm 18 and basically I'm not gonna see the streets till I'm 21. So I'm in there just doing my time, handling my business, um, working out. Um, I actually got into you know, art, I used to draw real well, so I got into art, painting, drawing, and I even did a bodybuilding competition there because I was fortunate enough while I was there to go to a fire camp which gave me a little bit more freedom than the average facility. So I did the bodybuilding competition, won that, but I still was lost in life. I didn't have any idea what I wanted to do. Um, I know I wanted to still be successful. I still wanted nice stuff, but I was still just kind of like just, I didn't have any direction, no mentor, no nothing. You know, while I was there, I got one visit, actually two visits, and um, you know, for the most part, I just associated with people that was in there and they, these guys didn't have a clue either. So I get out of CYA and um, I'm 21. So I missed three years of my life at this point. I should have already been through college and been you know, looking to get into a career, but I'm, I'm starting over fresh. So I take on some um, odd jobs, you know, working at clubs, um, doing retail stuff. 
And then I figure, what the heck, you know, let me jump back in college again, you know, try to get my education together. You know, I'm still a good student. I still can, you know, I, I know how to study. So I go through college and I'm doing pretty good. Um, I'm averaging about a 3.0 grade point average. And um, I'm probably one, I think I'm one, sem I was one semester shy of getting my AA. But while in college, I'm, at this time I'm living in uh, the Bay Area, I meet the weed plug. So the weed plug sounds better than going to college. So with the weed plug, I basically started supplying the homies in Sacramento with the chronic. And back then, the chronic was going for, you know, 45, 48. So I'm killing them. I'm getting them from Humboldt, and I'm driving it up to Sacramento, and I'm making a lick. You know, I'm making all this, and you know, I'm making pretty good money. And, um, you know, it was short money. It was, it was sh fast money, but it wasn't anything you could do long term. You know, my mom kind of had, this time I had moved back in with my mom, my stepdad, and she kind of had an inclination I was selling drugs, so she, um, she suggested that I get, you know, that I move. So I moved back to Sacramento. The weed plug dried up, and, you know, when the weed plug dried up, you know, you got to do what you got to do. So I got into selling all kind of other drugs. You know, I would sell everything from maybe Coke, maybe meth, maybe some weed here and there. If necessary, we put down a jack move. You know, I was doing whatever I had to do. You know, although, you know, a lot of people assumed that because of how I carried myself, oh, this dude's a square, you know, at nighttime I was creeping. I creep right up on somebody and, you know, we would do surveillance and if we caught a cat slipping or if he was bragging, you know, hey man, you know, you say you can get what? All right, and, you know, I want to get that. And uh, he'd roll up and we just, I'd put the, I'd put the smash down. we just take his, take his stuff. And that's how it went down. I mean, we was on some gangster stuff and now our mentality was still on a gangster mentality. I hadn't yet broke that cycle, you know, I still had that, I still had that kind of like that anger and frustration because I wasn't where I wanted to be in life, and yet I was still on some thug stuff, you know, so that went on for a while, and then I got, in, I got approached to do a bank robbery. Now, the bank robbery was the next step. You know, I'd already done everything else, rob, jack people, sold drugs, sold, sold pistols, you know, pop that gun. I had did everything. Gang bang. I had did it all. But this was the next stage. And I figured this is just something else part of the gangster resume. You know what I'm saying? You do everything else. Robbing a bank goes along with jacking somebody or selling drugs. And I didn't really think it through. You know what I mean? That, that choice was a choice that I didn't look at all my options. I wasn't broke. I had money. I had a nice car. I had a decent place. I wasn't like in a desperate situation. But my mentality was, you know, all or nothing. You know, I had the mentality that if it was time to go, it was time to go, F it, let's go. So I, I decided to do the bank robbery with some guys. And this bank robbery took place in 2000. And uh, the morning of the bank robbery, you know, I knew, it was a, I knew it was a bad idea. And I had started having second thoughts, but I thought that there, that was just nerves, you know? I shake it off, I said, man, that's just nerves, you know what I'm saying? And the morning of the bank robbery, I'm waiting for, to get picked up by my co-defendants, the guys who I robbed the bank with. And uh, my mom calls me and I'm sitting there and I'm in fatigues and I'm about to go rob this bank. And she's like, what are you doing? And she called me real early because we were up early. The bank opened at nine. We were going to get there at 9, 15, 9, 30 to, to rob them. And she called me and I'm like, oh, I'm just watching the news. I'm lying to her. So I'm sitting there and that was kind of like a sign. And there's little signs that you have when you're doing bad, doing stuff that you shouldn't be doing, that kind of tells you to do, the, do the, other, uh, the opposite thing. And I didn't go with my gut feeling. I went against it. And when she hung up the phone, I'm sitting there, and I should have just told these guys, you know what, I'm cool. But you know, because of my ego and because of my pride, I'm like, no, nah, I'm, I'm about it. I'm going to make this happen. I figure I robbed this bank. This would be my stepping stone. I'm going to use this money. I'm going to flip it in some drugs, open a record label. I'm going to be Suge Knight. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to open up my own death row. And, uh, you know, I was going to be a record uh, mogul. So that was my thing, you know, which is, is that was a bad plan. I should have went to the bank and just asked for a damn loan, you know. <laughs> but uh, I was, I was going to use the pistol. Anyways, we left my house, drove out to Thousand Oaks, and uh, me and another guy, while the driver sat in the car, we ran up in the bank. I had a ski mask on. I had an M1 carbine. People were just walking into the bank. And I was the first one in there, and I told everybody to get the F down. 
and everybody was screaming and basically I secured the, 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 the bank security guard. He got on the ground. The homie, the guy that I was robbing the bank with, he jumped over the counter and he, it went all bad. He pistol whipped somebody, took a bunch of money and uh, we were in there 30 seconds too long. While we're in there, I look out the window and I see a sheriff in a rain suit across the parking lot and I knew that it was, it was just all bad from there. You know, my life was about to change. We exit the bank, we get in a high speed chase on the 101. And you know, it's just like what you see on the news, these people thinking they can get away. Once that ghetto bird on you, you ain't going nowhere. And we were on a high speed chase, rolling down the 101. And um, they threw down the, the spike strip, you know, the car, we were rolling in the navigator and um, the car we were rolling as far as we could roll. When the car came to a stop, I jumped out, hopped over the fence, the center divider, ran across the freeway they sent the canine unit into the car and they, they caught the other two guys right off the back. They caught me up the street on the beach and um, there was nowhere for me to run. So that was the end of the bank robbery. It lasted maybe, you know, 30, 40 minutes, all on the news, you know, that was, that was it, you know. Wasn't, no, wasn't like in the movies where you, run, you get away and you go and spend the money and go to Bahamas, it wasn't none of that. So I, I committing this bank robbery, I was in the federal, federal institution and I was uh, looking at 12 years and I actually got sentenced to 10. 120 months, a decade. A decade for no money, a decade for basically acting the ass. And you know, I was 25, I wasn't gonna get out till I was damn near 35. So the federal pen changed my life. You know, up until this point, I hadn't really thought about my life or what, what direction I was going in or how I could change my life, but in the feds, you think about a lot of stuff. You know, I started off my sentence at Lompoc USP, which is one of the oldest USPs, and it's just a lot of hard criminals, a lot of gangsters up in there. I was in there with mafia guys, uh, gang bangers. The average person in Lompoc USP is doing probably 30, 30 years of life. You know, um, I came in there with 120 months, so I had 10 years. Um, I met my first mentor at Lompoc, you know, sitting in there, you know, looking at just time go by. Um, I was just, you know, I thought to myself, how, you know, how am I gonna do this for nine years? You know, wake up in a bunk, cold, you're dealing with knuckleheads, you know, people in there, you know, stabbing each other. It's just, it was a bunch of just, a bunch of mess, you know? Well, I started researching my case and I passed my time by doing legal, legal research and, um, you know, I had a guy, an older white guy, he laced me up on researching the law. And so once again, my education played a factor in me rehabilitating myself. And I used to go to the library every day and study, and then I would work out. And I had another guy that was an older black gentleman who was also my mentor. And he would, you know, kind of give me insight on being a black man, on being uh, confident and, you know, not being ignorant and being a knucklehead, he kind of showed me he was proper, wore his pants up high, was a real cool dude, you know, and he, he opened my eyes to a lot of things about myself that I didn't really understand. And so we used to walk the track every day. Now this guy, he was already been down probably 10 years. He was doing 20 years. The other guy, the, the white guy who was my mentor with the law, he was doing, I think, 50 years, and he was trying to get out. So like I said, the average person I talked to in there was already, had already been down 15, 20 years. I mean, it wasn't no short timers in there. And um, the mentality in there is so ignorant. I mean, in, you know, in prison, you have people, they create the herd mentality. They don't want you to be an individual thinker. They want you to you know, categorize you. They want to group you. They want to say, hey, you're black, so you should be either blood, crip, gangster disciple, vice lord, or some, you know, some other clique. You know, if you're Hispanic, you gotta be a Norteño Sereño or a border brother or you know, whatever the case may be. They try to put you in these little cliques or what neighborhood you're from, and that's an easy way for them to police you. And that's kind of like what they do on the street today. But you know, I kind of refused, I, I said it in my mind that I wasn't gonna allow myself to become institutionalized because I don't wanna get used to this. You know, I don't wanna get used to sleeping in the cage living around a thousand barbarians, you know? It, it just wasn't, it wasn't humane. It was the most inhumane experience you could go through is being in prison. 
Um, you know, I, I've talked to guys doing life who were gangsters on the street who were big time drug dealers. And, you know, these guys got cracked in their early 20s and now they're in their 40s and they, they want to go home, but they don't have an outlet. And I've seen guys, you know, talking to guys, I've seen them because I was a pretty friendly person. And because I was pretty articulate, a lot of guys would come and share things with me. I had a lot of guys and we would have some deep conversations and a, a lot of guys, I've seen a lot of guys break down, you know? Grown men cry because they wish they could go home again. You know, nobody wants to be in prison. You know, being a tough guy on the street, it might be cool, but in the end game, I mean, it ain't cool. Because, you know, when you're young, you're in there, you're thinking, oh man, I got the homies up in here, I'm chilling. But when you get into your 40s and 50s, I mean, there were dudes in Long Park that were older than my grandfather. And these dudes were doing 100 years. And that, that, I didn't want that to be me, you know what I'm saying? I didn't want to be that grandpa in prison, you know, doing all this time. So I, I worked on myself. I've read a lot of things about spirituality and I learned how to meditate. And I basically changed the way I thought about myself and life in general. And I maintained that attitude through earth, throughout my whole sentence, which allowed me to become a better person, you know? And, you know, throughout my sentences, you know, a lot of, actually, a lot of guys, you know, and especially black guys, because I didn't really hang out with the, you know, I kind of did my own thing. They used to get mad at me. I had a guy try to fight me because I was going to the law library. He's like, man, what are you doing, man? I'm like, I'm studying. He's like, what are you studying? I'm saying, I'm trying to learn about the law. He said, man, didn't you rob a bank? I'm like, yeah. He said, man, why don't you just do your time, man? I'm doing my time. I said, man, why are you worried about me? You do your time. This dude actually wants to fight me because I was trying to educate myself. That's what type of ignorance you have. You know what I mean? Just pure ignorance. And you know, you, you run across some of the worst people you could think of, but you also run across some really good dudes. You know, there's some good people in there also. Not everybody is a horrible person in prison. You know, some guys got caught up and you know, they weren't bad dudes. They just, somebody told on them. And for the most part, most people in there, you know, you, got, you think you got these so-called homies. Well, most of these homies, when they get cracked, they're gonna tell on you if they think they can get their time off. So there is no loyalty among thugs, gangsters. There is no hood pride. Man, I've seen the hardest dudes, you get their paperwork and they told, you know? They, they're doing 20 years, but they told so they didn't get life. And that's how it goes down in prison. Ain't nothing cool about it. You know, I've seen a guy get stabbed in the neck with a, with a chicken bone. I seen, uh, he was bleeding. I, I walked down, I looked at him, and I couldn't do nothing because there's cameras. I don't want to stop. If I stop, I might be under investigation. But yeah, they, they took a chicken bone out the kitchen, sharpened it up, and they stuck him in the neck. And so, you know, you see stuff like that and you, you conversate with people who are so ignorant, you start thinking, man, like, this is not where I wanna be at. This is not my future. So what I did while I was in there, like I said, I studied the law. I formed a positive group of people that I associated with. It was me, you know, some, Mex some uh, Hispanic guys, some Mexican guys. Um, we had a white guy in our group. We had a Korean guy. Um, we were pretty diverse. We had our own little group and we basically helped each other as far as um, educating each other, uh, moral support, and just staying positive. And, um, you know, that's what carried me through my sentence and made me a stronger person. Because, like, my, like I said earlier, through my visits, my mom didn't really, you know, she didn't really get involved with, you know, the whole jail thing. So this whole nine years, I basically didn't have any visits. So, you know, imagine your family right now and then not seeing them for nine years. Well, that's what I experienced is not seeing my family for nine years. And a lot of people have pretty much written me off. They figured, hey, man, you did, you know, you're just a, you're just a career criminal. You know, you robbed banks, you done, did home invasion, sold drugs, you're just, you're, you're done. And so, you know, when I got out, I was paroled to a halfway house in South Central. And I didn't know that, you know, that's not my neighborhood, but, you know, I'm in LA and I'm hungry, you know what I mean? I'm hungry to be successful. So, you know, I'm in the halfway house and I'm basically trying to reach out to people that I haven't talked to in almost a decade to see if they can hook me up a job or offer me some type of an opportunity. Well, I was fortunate because I did have a few friends out here that were able to, you know, hook me up with a job. And um, through some of the friends I did time with, I was able to get a car so I could drive around and make it to my job. So that's what allowed me to get back on my feet. But if I didn't have that, you know, I could have been homeless. You know, I could have been one of them dudes on Western and, 
you know, and, and, and over there MLK begging for money, you know what I mean? I, I could have I could have easily just been on the street, but I, you know, I, luckily I had some opportunities and I was able to hustle, but I seen a lot of guys where they didn't have that opportunity. My co-defendant, the guy who robbed the bank with me, who jumped over the counter, who pistol whipped the teller, he did 14 years. And when he got out, he was living on Skid Row. And he wasn't as fortunate. He was on Skid Row and the LAPD were doing a cleanup and he got into with the LAPD and they shot him five times. He's dead. My other co-defendant who drove the car, he got out before me, but he caught, he, some, some, some um, obscure disease, I believe it was like lupus or something, he, he caught lupus and he died. So out of all three of the people, all, both the people that I robbed the bank with, they're both dead. I'm the only one that's still alive. So I know there's a purpose behind me having done this time and it's not in vain, you know? A lot of times people get out and they don't think about what they've done, but I know I was never really a bad kid. I just made some bad decisions. So there had to be a bigger purpose for me to have made these decisions and do all this time. So, you know, I, I got out, started, you know, I got a job. And while I was in prison, I came up with the concept fresh out, you know, life after the penitentiary, you know, you, you got lock up, you got all these shows, locked up a bra, locked up San Quentin. Well, what happens when a lot of these guys get out of prison? You know, a lot of these hardcore gang members who are hollering through the mail, the slot, the food slot, or who are sagging, talking all this stuff, when they get on the street, they ain't about nothing. They can't provide for their families. They, they don't have the responsibility to take care of kids. It's, it's pretty sad. And, you know, then again, you have some people who get out and do the right thing. So I want to kind of document that. So I started Fresh Out, Life After Penitentiary, which is on YouTube, that I've been producing now for about four years and we're working on getting the show picked up. And so that's one of my dreams that and being, you know, being involved in Hollywood and film that I've done with a business partner of mine that's allowed me to make a living for myself. We've also started clothing the line. This is our hats. We got t-shirts. And so that's one of my, that's one of my personal um, ventures that I'm doing right now. Besides restoring cars, fixing up muscle cars, I got a uh, a business where I, I take old schools and I flip them, fix them up and sell them. I do customization, stuff like that. And I also do a little bit of personal training. So I was able to use my, my skill set to open up doors. But like I said, you know, going to prison, a lot of times when you get out, you know, the opportunity just isn't there. People don't, you know, when they look at your resume and see you have a 10 year gap in your resume and you have uh, a felony, they'd rather ha hire the person with a college degree with no felony. So, you know, it's best to really think about the long term. I didn't really, I never really thought about the long term. You know, I didn't never, I never had a mentor who said, "Hey, man, that clothing line is a great idea. Why don't you, you know, do this or do that? Or have you, have you ever been to a, a, a the garment district? Have you ever did this?" I didn't have anybody to guide me with that. You know, I didn't have anybody to who supported me on, you know, on becoming a, maybe a professional skateboarder or a shoe designer. So I turned to the streets. And the streets took me to prison, took me to juvenile hall. It, it just, it led me down just a dark, a dark place, you know, but I was fortunate enough to recover from that. But the thing is, you know, you have to really, a lot of times the people you think are your friends aren't really your friends. And so you got to think about these people that you're hanging out with, where do you see yourself out in five years and where do you see them at in five years? And if you can answer that question, that'll kind of tell you what direction you want to go in. Because a lot of times, you know, these people that you're hanging out with aren't people that you're going to be hanging out with in five years. So you got to really think about your future and the choices you're making and also your visions. You know, don't let nobody tell you you can't do something. You know, it's all right to be different. It's all right to be a square. You know, it's all right to have, you know, to not follow the, follow the herd, you know. It, it's, and it's all right to think outside the box. You know, a lot of times you might have ideas or you might have a dream and just because nobody around you has that same dream or goal or nobody around you could vision what you're talking about, you think that it's not possible. Well, anything's possible. All you guys have the potential to do whatever it is your mind can think of. If you can think it, you can do it and you can create your own reality. So, you know, the bottom line is don't let anybody tell you you can't. And, you know, it's all right to say, hey, man, I'm cool. 
You know, hey man, you want to go ride with me to go do this? No, nah, I'm cool. You know, it's, it's, all, it's all right. You don't, you're not being soft if you turn down an opportunity to go rob somebody or to go run drugs for somebody or to go do something stupid. It's, it's all right to turn that down. You know, they can talk about you all they want, but you're knowing that you're not putting yourself in harm's way. You're not doing something negative. And that's the best feeling at the end of the day because those people are going to eventually end up in prison or jail. You know, there's no future in that. So, you know, I say, you know, education, if I had to do it all over again, I would have, you know, took my SATs. I would have studied more. I would have been that square. I wouldn't have been hanging out on the block. I would have made different choices, you know. I would have, you know, hopefully have found a mentor, somebody who could have basically get, provided me the support I needed to have the confidence because I didn't have confidence until I got to the PN. When I got to federal prison, when I realized what I was really capable of, you know, when I was studying law, when I was, um, you know, just hanging out with guys in there and they used to come to me for advice or I would help them with petitions, I learned about what my value was. But you guys are young, you still have so much opportunity to really recognize your potential and, and figure out what it is you want to do with yourself. So, hey man, you know, while you, ha while you have the opportunity, take advantage of it and reach out to people, even if it's, out if it's outside your immediate circle. I mean, you're in LA, I was in Sacramento, we didn't have the entertainment industry, we didn't have the beaches, we didn't have the mountains, we didn't have all this, you know. You guys have a lot of opportunity to see things and, and basically associate with a lot of success. So I would say take advantage of that, you know. Maximize while you can and ask questions. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Don't be afraid to be different, you know. But uh, yeah, that, that's, that's my story, you guys. And um, you know, I would like to, if you guys have any questions or anything that you guys want to inquire about, feel free. When I was sitting in the pen and I realized that I had an epiphany that I had to do this over and over again for the next eight years, I realized that I had to change the way I thought, the, the, my mind frame. It wasn't, it wasn't the physical, physical actions that got me there, it was the way I thought. So I had to really look at myself and think about who I was as a person and try to change that person. And that's what allowed me, I did a lot of reflection and um, you know, I just, you know, just kind of like realize that this isn't who I am, you know, this isn't where I want to be at and these are not the type of people I want to associate with, you know, and it, um, it was a, it was a, it was a, it was a basically a, a turning point in my life, you know, and I'd never done that before, I'd never really saw back, I'd never really sat back and thought about life and where, what direction I was going in or who I was or the choices I made, but this, 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 this situation I couldn't go home from it required me to do a lot of thinking and I thought about who I was and, and um, I just started changing my whole, the, my whole MO, the way I thought, the way I acted, everything. And I did it in a negative environment. So I know if I can do it in prison, once I got out, where I have all this opportunity, I was gonna be successful. She doesn't really, you know what, there's still like, it's almost like um, an elephant in the room because we've never even talked about why nobody came to visit me. You know, I mean, nobody's ever addressed like, oh, you know, what'd you go through in there? What was it like? You know, are you all right? Did you, did you get into any fights? Did anybody try to, you know, anybody try to rape you or do anything to you? Nobody asks any questions. Everybody just figures it's all, it's all good now. And sometimes, you know, I'm kind of curious, you know, to know why nobody's inquired about it, but everybody acts like, oh, you know, it seems like you're all right, so you must be all right. But no, we haven't really talked about it. And, you know, sometimes I think about bringing it up, but I don't really want to get into an argument, but I think sooner or later I'm gonna have to, you know, bring it, you know, make it a point because there's, you know, things like that kind of like, 
it, it makes me think about what type of person I am and, and what's my value at. It makes you think about what your worth is. If nobody wants to take the time to come see you, and then what's your purpose in living? You know, you, you, think, you think about like, why should I even exist? But luckily, I turned that into a positive and I used it to motivate my success. So, you know, your family, family is always crazy, you know, family situations. The only support system I had was from the guys I met in prison, the group we formed. We formed a, a pretty strong um, like support group. And while I was in prison, I, I wrote like three or four books. I published one of them before I got out. And um, you know, I saved up money. I used to do legal work for money. So while a lot of guys couldn't, you know, they weren't very educated. A lot of guys didn't have a GED. So they used to bring their legal work to me and we would charge them. And we would use that money and send it home. And some of it, we would use it in prison to buy food. And so uh, primarily the guys I did time with helped me out. I mean, the first car I bought when I got out was through a friend I met in prison. He, he sent me the money to buy the car. The second car I got was from another guy I met in prison. He helped me out. My family didn't do anything for me. You know, my family, I didn't actually see them for, for about a year and a half after I got out. And I had to rent a car and drive to them. So I didn't have any support from the outside. And, you can, and a lot of times, People don't have that support, so when you feel like you're abandoned, you're, you're willing to do whatever. It don't matter if you go back to prison because you have nobody on the street anyway. So, like I said, I, I was just fortunate that I didn't turn that into a negative and just give up on life and decide to be just an overall just career criminal and just say to, to hell with it, you know what I'm saying? I, I had that support structure and a lot of the guys I did time with, we still keep in touch. A couple of guys, a lot of them are out. We, we hang out. I've seen a bunch of them. And we do business deals and stuff like that together or network. So we've actually kept that bond. But um, yeah, if it wasn't for those guys, I don't know where I'd be at. Yep. Um, well, I wrote a book on the law. I wrote a couple study books which were based on the law. I actually use a different name. I use a pen name because it's funny, a lot of people, because of the way, the way I look, or maybe because of the skin color, they underestimate, I guess, the level of like, um, just the, your level of education. So it's funny, I used, to, I used to be in a law library and do a lot of research, so I compiled a bunch of notes and I put it together and I, I made a book out of it. But in the book, I changed the name of the guy who wrote the book. And a lot of times I would talk to people about stuff and they would look at me like I was crazy, but when I put this book together, and I showed it to a guy and he read it. He's like, man, this guy is smart, man. This guy knows his stuff, man, blah, blah, blah. And I'm looking at the guy, I'm like, man, you don't even know that I wrote this book. But I'm laughing at him. He done bought the book from me because I'm hustling. Like I said, my education allowed me to hustle where I didn't have to get involved in drugs in prison or gambling or stuff like that. But it's funny how people perceive you when they think that it's not you. And that's how society is. You know, I, a lot of times, like right now, even with the clothing line or my other, like um, my car business, I say that I work with somebody else. And when people hear that, they think, oh, okay. Because they don't want to really put money in my pocket. They'd rather put money in somebody else's pocket or they have some type of inner animosity that they don't want to support what I'm doing. So now a lot of the businesses that I do or that I, I'm involved in, like I'm working on an app right now also, which is, it involves cars. But I'm not going to tell anybody that the app is mine. I'm going to tell them that I work for somebody that came up with a great idea. And that's how you got to do stuff sometimes because people hate on you, man. You know, a lot of times people will, they'll be jealous and they think that you shouldn't have more than they have. And it's sad, but these are people you think that are your, your homies, your friends, your family, and behind closed doors, they don't really want to see your success at a level beyond theirs. So...
guess, let's ask again, what, what would you have liked to have been said or done for you, or what mindset would you have liked to have had so that you could have had the consciousness you now have today? And in high school, I wish I would have had somebody that could have given me some type of insight on life, on, on basically career opportunities and just preparing myself. You know, they have the career center in, in high school, but you know, it's, it's, it's not really that involved, but being able to have somebody like say, um, somebody who's involved in real estate or somebody who's a physical therapist or somebody who's a doctor and actually have one-on-one -on -one time with somebody like that and them giving me ideas about what I can do, what my potential is, I think it would have made a big difference, you know. I had a lot of ideas. I mean, I, I used to write Reebok, I wrote Nike, I sent them pictures of the shoes. I, I had a clothing line before FUBU, I had a clothing log, line called FIDU, you know, for everyday use, and me and my friend were making clothing, but we didn't know what the heck we were doing. We didn't have any support. If I'd have had more support as far as somebody to guide me, I think I would have, I would have, I would have probably been a millionaire by now, and I wouldn't have been, I would have never turned back to crime. You know, I would have went in a different direction, but I didn't have that mentor. You know, my mom and my stepdad, okay, they put food on the table, they clothed me, they made sure I had a place to live, but you know, outside of that, she didn't know how to, she didn't know how to support my dreams or my visions. She wasn't, she didn't have the, the vision I had. So I needed to go outside my immediate circle to find that. And if I would have had that outlet, I think I would have been a successful a lot sooner than what I am now. And I probably would have never got back. I would have never got in trouble. No other questions? Um, when you felt like giving up, what kept you from going um, When I felt like giving up, I, I used to just, I did a lot of, um, I used to read a lot of magazines and a lot of books, you know, and I just, I always envisioned that, you know, I can come out of this. You know, I used to, when I was in prison, I had a, a, a board, a vision board, and I had a picture of like a Ferrari, a big house, uh, you know, money, um, golf course, you know, just different things, you know, that would motivate me. And the guards would walk by and they would look at that and they're like, you think you're going to get out and have that? You know, you think that you're going to be living in some big house or you're going to be driving these type of cars? I'm like, yeah. They're like, okay, yeah, right. What you going to do, Timmons? What you going to do that's going to make you different than everybody else? And I would ignore it, you know, and they, the thing is, a lot of times people try to create self-doubt within yourself and you got to, you got to look past that, you know, because a lot of these people, their life is done. You know, some people don't max out their potential and they don't want you to go beyond there. So you got to kind of step to the side and keep, sometimes you got to keep your dreams to yourself but don't let go of them, you know? There's people out there who have the same dreams you do, you just gotta find them. And these people will support your dreams and maybe even help you achieve them. But you can never, don't ever let nobody take that away from you, man. That's your, that's your burning desire, you know what I'm saying? And, and, and you, can never, uh, you can never give up on that, you know? Even if you try something and you, you don't succeed at it, it's not like it's a failure, it's just an opportunity that didn't go well. I mean, a lot of successful businessmen, people who are multimillionaires, have had failed businesses. They're, they filed bankruptcy. So you don't you're not necessarily gonna become a millionaire off your first rap album or your first invention or your first movie. It doesn't happen like that. We all gotta grind. You gotta, you gotta push through, but eventually it will pay off. You just gotta stay positive. Dumb. The only TV I used to watch when I was little was Electric Company and Sesame Street. My mom, <laughs> my mom had me. My mom had me pretty young. My mom was 14 years older than me, so she was still in high school. And I'm quite sure her going to school and studying and reading had an effect on me. But when I was little, she used to read to me, and she subscribed to a book club for me. And I used to read books. And the more books I read, the more money I get. So if I read a book, I get 50 cents. So I try to read as many books as a week as possible so I can get more money. So that was my first uh, experience on making money with reading books. 
So I've read every book that she can think of. And she'd always be ordering books. And I'd be reading them, reading them, reading them. She's like, you sure you're reading all these books? I'm like, yeah. She's like, what is this book? And I'd tell her what it is. What about this book? And I'd tell her. And she'd be like, oh, okay. So that was my motivation. And it just carried on. English has always been one of my, best, my better subjects. And I've always gotten straight A's in English. So reading was always came naturally to me. And it really helped me when I, you know, sad to say, when I was in prison. Because a lot of guys couldn't read. And I made money off of that because I would read for these guys and they'd pay me to type. So I'd type and read and figure out stuff for these guys and I, that's how I made my money. So, you know, reading is so important and it just opens up so many more doors. And it's funny you said that because I've ran across people out here today doing business and when they meet me, they're all intimidated. But then after I started talking, they'll say, well, I never thought a person with your stature and with your demeanor and what you've been through would articulate yourself like this. And it's like almost, like, I'm looking at him like, wow, what, you, was I supposed to act a certain way that you've seen on TV? Like some, you know, thugged out, you know, what's up, my, you know. You know, they expect that from you. And I basically go against that. So don't let anybody pigeonhole you into a stereotype because stereotypes are basically things they use to limit you. Get rid of stereotypes. Get rid of labels. You're a person and you're a human being first. You know what I mean? This, this, this right here, this is just what I was born into. I had no choice. This is my vessel. This is what I move around in. This is like I went to, like there was an analogy, I went to the dealership and I bought this physique. Six, you know, six foot, 250 pounds, you know, blah, 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 blah. These are all the little bells and whistles I bought. And this is what I'm driving around in while I'm on earth. But realize that each one of us underneath this, we're all the same. You know what I mean? Skin color is, is, is just what we're, it's just something they gave us to, accentuate who we are as, as individuals. So don't put yourself in a, in a box and don't label yourself and, and read as many books as possible. What's your question? What's that? Will I, would I change anything about my past? Yeah, if I had the opportunity, I would have studied, I would have studied hard and I would have tried to get into an Ivy League school. I wish I would have went to um, college. I wish I would have took college more serious. I didn't have anybody really making it a big point. So even though I was good in school, school was kind of, it was kind of easy for me. I can go home. I mean, every subject, I can get an A in math. I might have to study a little bit more, but school wasn't that hard for me. So I didn't take it serious and I didn't realize how far I could have taken my education because I didn't have anybody really pushing me. If I would have had that, I would have stayed in school. I would have, I would have, I would have, you know, wanted to go to Stanford or UCLA or, uh, or you know, Harvard. I would have took it to the next level, but I didn't have that support. I, so I definitely would have changed not going to college. I would have went to college. Um, never met my dad. My, supposedly he lives in a neighborhood somewhere, but I never ran across him. But um, I think if I would have had a, had been a, a male role model, I think would have made a big difference. I mean, I had a grandfather, but he was old school. He, he, he never really, he didn't say, you know, he never said, oh, I love you or blah, 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 blah. He says it now because he's old, but growing up, I never had a black male tell me he loved me, you know what I'm saying? And I'm not, you know, and I don't, a lot of people use that as a, you know, as a sob story and they try to use it as a crutch to justify why they are who they are. But I think it makes a difference, man. That's why I think reaching out, some people who don't have dads, it's okay to, you know, have a, a male mentor, but I think it would have made a difference because my mom could only do so much. I mean, I'm a male, you know what I mean? It, it's like, and I'm an alpha male, so I felt like my mom could only tell me so much and I was gonna do what I was gonna do, but if I'd have had that male figure in the house, you know, maybe he'd put his foot down and I'd have been like, oh, okay, and he would have, he could have got through to me in ways my mom couldn't. So I think having a father would have made a difference, but my mom, she did the best she could with what she had, so I can't be mad at her, you know? What's your question? Um, yeah, I'm thinking, I was, I'm thinking about actually putting together like a, um, like a, a parent, um, like a parent relationship book, like, you know, talk to your kids and communicating because I think communication is one of the biggest things that's lacking in a household. And that's why we have all the problems we have with basically kids doing bad because parents don't really communicate. I mean, it's one thing that to, to tell a kid, don't do this or 
I'm going to whoop you or this and that, I'm going to kick you out the house. But that's another thing to actually communicate and to share emotion. And I think that makes a big difference because there's a lack of that in society and there's a lack of that in the household. And that's what, that's a challenge. You know, a lot of people, there's a lot of secrets at home and they don't talk about them. You know, people don't, they don't share. You know, you have dinner, you're on the phone, you're looking at, you know, YouTube, you're playing video games, nobody conversates. There's nothing, nobody asks you about your day, you know, um, you know what, you, what you're thinking about or, you know, what your future is about. I mean, I think that um, uh, there needs to, you know, I want to put a book together about that because I've thought about it and I thought about if I had a kid, how would I talk to him? You know, what would I share with him? So I'm really, you know, I'm considering, I haven't had the time yet because I'm working on a TV show getting picked up, but that's my next step is doing a book about uh, parent, uh, you know, parent-child relationships. Well, again, sir, we're just so thankful for your time. Um, before we uh, officially wrap this up, just on behalf of, we have some of this here for you know, your support team, but essentially from, on behalf of Block High School, I just want to present you a certificate of appreciation to Mark Big Hurt Timmons for coming to us on Career Day. Appreciate it. Thank you, man.